Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowman, here once again with some more Macedonia, the, well, Macedonian Wars in particular. Uh, they're on to the Battle of Kalinicus, 171 BC. Uh, yeah, um, this is the third part, a uh, third of four parts, uh, the third of four parts parts yeah good deal i can count uh yes um so previously uh macedonia just they just took a big hit plain and simple they had a battle which they had a chance of winning it just didn't go their way they were kind of outnumbered and things just didn't go right then they got flanked and that was basically it um I don't think if they win that battle, they're going to win the war. But I just think Macedonia needed to get the allies together on the same page. I've been thinking this through the like the beginning. I, I just don't think they have the power to take on Rome themselves. Uh, props to them for having the Dehunas, the whatever, the balls to go for it, you know, there, you know try and get them while they were down you know with Hannibal and stuff like that but I I think this I mean it's easy to look down with hindsight you know it's a lot easier to look back now I mean I could still be wrong but I, I just think they need to get all their allies that league and like basically like all of if that's is that all of Greece you know just different parts right I uh, get them all together and then you know then you might have a chance because you have more power but as soon as uh, the guys, either I guess the Greek skates or Greek countries or whatever they're called, as soon as they sided with uh, the Romans, it was over. They're like Rome was already powerful and it was already far fetched that you're going to win as it is. And then you got your fellow Greek states kind of joining forces. It, it, it's just too it's just too high of a mountain to climb after that. So I, it was just a matter of time, but that we're this is only halfway through the series so i'm not sure what to expect i mean i'm expecting some kind of power gain uh i think they need to get some more allies together like this like i said they have to get some allies to go after rome and maybe that's gonna happen this time but i don't know maybe then it gives rome a couple of jabs you know and you know just hit them back a couple of times you know make them uh like don't go down without a fight, you know, kind of thing. So, uh, anyways, we're going to jump right into it, guys. Before we do, please hit that like and subscribe button. Please and thank you. And, uh, yeah, we're going to jump into it. Hope you guys are having an amazing day. Uh, it's about 11 in the evening for me. Doo -doo -doo. But, yes, let's do it, guys. Three, two, one, like and subscribe. Bam. When the patricians in Rome learned that their legions had won a great victory over Philip V at Cynocephaly, they must have considered the eastern problem over with, but they were very wrong. Oh. Macedonian military power had been massively curbed, but another great world-conquering threat still loomed in the east. The Seleucid monarch Antiochus III had ambitions of world conquest and his actions in the late 190s would set in motion events that would eventually result in the Third Macedonian War and the Battle of Callinicus. I'm sure you've heard us talk about Magellan TV okay. before, one of our long-time sponsors of this channel. Magellan is an incredible Magellan from anywhere on any device. After the peace conference at Tempe had been finalized, Titus Quinctius Flamininus decided to prove decisively that it was Rome who would be the true saviour of Greece. During the Asthymian Games of Spring 196, Flamininus declared that Rome would leave the Greeks free, untaxed and autonomous after over a century of Macedonian rule. He was mobbed at the festivities and showered with honours from the grateful city-states. The Roman Senate decreed five days of thanksgiving for the victory at Cynocephaly. Also at the games, Flamininus was met by a party of envoys who had come at the behest of the Seleucid king Antiochus III. They came in order to congratulate the consul on his victory and to assure the Romans of their liege's peaceful intentions. They were met with cold sternness and demands. 
Antiochus was to keep away from the Greek cities, withdraw his garrisons from those he had already seized, and was ordered not to attempt a crossing into Greece. In addition to the Seleucid monarch's European incursions and his expansionism, Antiochus had also brought the fury of the Romans onto himself by accepting their mortal enemy, Hannibal, into his court. The war which broke out between the two expanding states climaxed at the Battle of Magnesia in 190, where Antiochus was badly defeated and Seleucid power was permanently broken. In this battle's aftermath, Rome increasingly began to rule its Greek friends with an iron fist. After Cynocephaly, I mean, what did they think was going to happen? I mean, they didn't want to rule their Philip, the Macedonians. Like, what do you think Rome was going to do? Just let them be free? I mean, obviously, they're going to want something out of the deal, you know, and Rome's obviously more powerful than Philip was. So, is Rome, you know, I mean, they asked for it. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's it's frustrating, obviously, as someone because you know I love Rome. I just no one get me wrong. I think Rome is amazing and all that stuff. But for the sake of videos, for me, for videos, it's a lot more fun when like the two sides are more even. You know, when there's, you know, up when it's up in the air, who the possible winner could be, you know, and it's frustrating because I know Greece, if they all united and they're all great, it would be, you know, a formidable foe for the Romans, just like Hannibal, you know, he was, you know, Hannibal had a chance to win that war. I mean, he was a formidable, you know, whatever, enemy or whatever you want to call it, and Greece could have been that, and uh, I just, I guess they, they're all kind of getting each other's way, kind of thing. And it's frustrating because I want that giant big colossus, two colossus going at each other, but it's not gonna happen, but anyways. Yes, you guys ever think the same thing in these videos? Like, come on, root for the underdog, you get more powerful, to, so it gives the, the big dog the run for their money, kind of thing. Or is it just me? iron fist after Cynocephaly. The second son of Philip V, Demetrius, became a hostage of the Romans, and he had emerged from that experience a committed Romanophile. Supported by the Roman Senate, he returned to Macedon with a very different attitude. The royal court in Pella had become bitterly divided over the Roman issue. One of these circles was led by Demetrius and consisted of nobles who favoured peace with Rome. Another group formed around the duo of Philip V and his eldest son, Perseus, and was packed with firebrands who advocated resistance against the invaders. Both factions began... I mean, I, I can see both sides. Demetrius' son, who's lived in Rome, he's lived there long enough. He probably gained friends and, and you know, probably likes where he grew up in. You know, I'm sure he didn't grow up in no jail cell or anything. I'm sure he had, like, a proper upbringing and learned the way of life over there. So, you know, he has a soft spot for Rome. And he probably also knows really the capabilities that Rome, you know, you know, probably can't be beaten. But, you know, so he doesn't want, he knows what he's up against. So he doesn't want to, like, you know, go against that. And, of course, on the other side, I mean, they, they might know that Rome is a, uh, you know, very powerful, but, you know, this is their homeland. They don't want to bow down to Rome. You know, they want to rule themselves. And so you can understand, even if they think, you know, that they're the underdogs, they still want to put up a fight in battle for their freedom kind of thing. So I can definitely understand both sides of this. Again, and un Invaders. Both factions began an underhanded war of propaganda. Perseus's mother was routinely slandered as being a low birth concubine, implying that Perseus was less legitimate than Demetrius. The latter made a mistake at this point, confiding to a courtier named Didus that he planned to flee to Rome. This man promptly told Philip, who also discovered a letter speaking of Demetrius's lust for the throne. 
Despite it probably being a forgery, Didus poisoned Demetrius in the winter of 181 BC on the order of Philip. The Damn, Philip killed his own son. Damn! I mean, he was probably like, you're no son of mine, man. A son of mine is against Rome, you know. That's all I've been fighting my whole life against Rome. And you want to come back after being taken hostage by this country? And you want to fight for them? And it just reminds me, what is that syndrome where, you know, Stockholm or some syndrome where someone's kidnapped and over time they feel for their the person who captured them or something like that? And you kind of thing. I forget what that's called, but... So I definitely feel Philip here, I guess, you know, as back then in the day, I guess maybe this wasn't uncommon, but yeah, I can definitely see uh, Philip's uh, anger here. And uh, yeah, uh, I guess Philip may be also afraid that, you know, his son might try and kill him for the throne, you know, so he's like, uh, I'd rather you die than I die. <laughs> wow. Man. The outcome was a surge in hostility between Rome and Macedon. The situation destabilized even further in 179 BC, when after over four decades of rule, Philip V passed away in Amphipolis while preparing for a campaign against the Thracians. With his rival Demetrius also dead, Perseus became the king of Macedon. Makes sense. He did what new Antigonid kings always had to, immediately reaffirming old friendships and building new ones. Rivals to the throne were eliminated, and in this new Rome-dominated world, it was necessary to send emissaries to the Senate, hoping for their official recognition of Perseus's accession to the throne. Reluctantly, this was granted. I know you're, I know you're against Rome and everything, but that's, that's the thing, you're against Rome, like, why do you need Rome's, like, approval to be king like you're against them like does it matter or is it just like one of those things like roman's word means a lot when it comes to their friends around them you know so if rome thinks that you're king your friends around you are less likely to kind of go after you that's the only reason i can really think about you know that mattering if roman approves of it because i guess macedon is still like you know he's Macedonia, he's he's basically a puppet king, as they call him, right? I don't know. On the diplomatic front, Perseus also entered into many alliances and diplomatic arrangements with the various city-states. Naturally, this was to the great annoyance of the Romans. Furthermore, to the east, Perseus astutely married his sister to Prusius II of Bithynia, and the king himself married the daughter of Seleucid monarch Seleucus IV. Hmm. So in addition to playing nice with the Greeks in the city-states, Perseus was also swiftly gaining a network of useful Hellenic allies in Asia Minor, much to the increasing anger of Pergamon, which was excluded from these affairs. Its king, Eumenes II, played his kingdom's usual part as an informant to the Romans. Initial insistences and warnings by Eumenes to the Roman Senate fell on receptive ears. In 175 and 174 BC, repeated Roman warnings to Perseus refused to cow the young king. Moreover, he performed a grand spectacle of marching his entire army on a peaceful parade through Delphi, the sacred center of the Greek world. The message was clear, he was the protector of the Greeks, not the Romans. Okay. Increasingly urgent embassies from Pergamon began to beseech the Roman Senate for help, and in early 172 BC, Eumenes himself came to plead his case. What? He claimed that the peace had allowed Ma Okay, your mind, let me listen to this first before I say it, because it might answer my question. ...himself came to plead his case. He claimed that the peace had allowed Macedon to fully recover its strength. Finally, the Pergamese king played his trump card, stating to the Romans that, I felt it would be utterly disgraceful if I failed to reach Italy to warn you before he arrived here with his army. Cynically playing on the post-Hannibalic fear of invasions, Eumenes got... Why does Hermenes care? I mean, it's not like uh, Macedonians attacking them. Like... 
maybe there's something here I'm not realizing, I guess. But, like, I guess he's their allies to Rome. I guess that's why. But, I mean, it, it doesn't seem to me that, you know, Macedonia is going to have any effect on him. So why is he ratting him out to Rome? Uh, I mean... It's so easy because you, cause you can look back on history of Romans are ruling like everything. Uh, but I guess he, he sees Macedonia as more of a threat than Rome to take their land because Macedonia is closer. Uh, I don't know. I think I think they have more to gain. Hey, let like the Greek states and, you know, Rome fight each other and you kind of just chill over here kind of thing. And I don't know. his way post Hannibalic fear of invasions Eumenes got his way the subsequent diplomatic pressure and investigations into Perseus's conduct would turn into a self-fulfilling prophecy as the king would see the Senate was intent on destroying him Philip V may have been the aggressor in the previous war but now the Romans were hungry for conflict with Perseus Roman envoys sent to negotiate a truce with the Macedonian king, then boasted of deceiving him into thinking there was even a chance of peace. In fact, the truce was purely a measure in order to gain more time for the Romans to prepare for war, as they refitted a fleet of old ships and embarked a powerful army from Brundisium to Apollonia. This Roman new cunning of deception and underhanded tactics was not met with approval from all quarters. More traditionalist senators remembered a time when the Romans treated their enemies as honoured and honourable men. It turned out that such methods were no way to run an empire. Whatever the case, the Roman Senate had decided that the only way to maintain their position in Greece was to have no equals at all. The Antigonid monarchy had to disappear, and the Third Macedonian War began. Yep. Roman consul Publius Licinius Crassus crossed the Adriatic in the late summer of 171 BC in order to take control of the legions there. At the same time, Eumenes of Pergamon arrived at Chalcis with his fleet, disembarking with 6,000 infantry and 1,000 cavalry of his own. The Romans had unquestioned mastery of the Aegean Sea, so they dismissed the allied vessels only retaining Eumenes' assistance. Meanwhile, Perseus advanced south into Thessaly, ravaging lands on the way, and encamped just to the south of Mount Ossa, having taken command of the army his father had begun to rebuild. At the same time, Licinius secured the Greek west coast and advanced into Thessaly via Athamania. When the consul yeah. arrived at the Greek city of Larissa, he encamped just outside the town by a hill called Callinicus, where he was reinforced by Eumenes' Pergamene forces. As the Macedonians had grown bolder due to their unopposed ravaging of the Thessalian countryside, Perseus decided to march toward the Roman camp, erecting their own around five miles away. After resting his army for the night, Perseus drew up his line into formation and marched his cavalry, as well as the light infantry, forwards. The phalangists stayed in reserve. Odrysian king Cotes IV commanded the Thracian cavalry and interspersed light infantry on the left flank, while Macedonian horsemen and Cretan skirmishers on the right were led by Medon of Beroea. Both wings were flanked by the king's cavalry and auxiliary infantry from various foreign nations, while the centre was made up of Perseus's elite Agema, the Sacred Cavalry, and 400 slingers in front. Opposite the Macedonians, Licinius's field army formed up its heavy infantry safely behind their camp's ramparts, sending their own cavalry and skirmishers out to meet the enemy. The Roman right wing, commanded by Caius Licinius Crassus, consisted of the Italian Equites, with Velites scattered between them while on the left, Valerius Levinus commanded the Greek allied cavalry and infantry. In the centre, Quintus Mucius led a force of Gauls, Thessalians and other volunteer cavalry. Missile fire from javelins and slingstones opened the battle, 
causing light casualties on both sides, before Cotis's Thracian horsemen charged. They fought like wild beasts, according to Livy, and smashed through the Roman right-wing cavalry. Damn. At the same time, Perseus and his elite Agamer troops broke the Roman center. Believing he could turn the battle into a decisive engagement, Perseus was about to order his phalanx into battle, but was persuaded not to take such a risk by Euander the Cretan. Thanking Euander for his wise counsel and taking the victory where he could, Perseus withdrew back to his camp. 200 wow. Roman cavalry and 2,000 infantry had died, and only 60 of Perseus's men had died. Further skirmishes followed this battle, but the campaigning seized. I couldn't. I, I was in disbelief how fast that battle was. Like, that's the name of this episode. Oh, the video is almost over. Wow. Uh, but yeah, like I was expecting. Uh, I was like expecting some kind of random Romans to uh, just appear off the hillside or something. But no, like Macedonia just straight up like Matt like pff, just destroyed them. And that was kind of it. The battle, these seemed to last like 10 seconds. So, damn, you go Macedonia, man. Give them a, give them a punch, man. Good job. You know, it's like you ain't going down without a, down without a fight, man. You, you're pushing forward. That's awesome, dude. I'm happy about that. <laughs> Definitely happy about that. Good job. Let's see how this plays out here. Further skirmishes followed this battle but the campaigning season of 171 BC was essentially over. The Romans proceeded to raise the anti-Roman cities in Boeotia. Haliartus was completely annihilated after a short siege, 2,500 men were sold into slavery, and the town remained desolate for decades afterwards. This type of increasingly notorious Roman savagery in Greece, along with Perseus's victory at Callinicus, made the Macedonian king appear to be the champion of the Greeks. Most who believed this were still too frightened of Rome to take action, but the Molossians of Epirus did defect. One setback Sorry. after another appeared to be striking the Romans in this conflict, and this was only compounded when Perseus launched a successful raid on the Roman fleet at Aureus, destroying ships and spoiling grain supplies. However, Perseus knew that he needed a decisive victory in battle. The Macedonian Wars will continue and very soon we will cover the Battle of Pydna. So make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have... Man, maybe I'll get surprised here and there's more... Uh, uh, there's more episodes to come, maybe. I hope I, hope I, don't get, I, hope I get surprised by it. Um, I'm being dumb here. I'm looking at the date of these uploads. Okay, this was January of last year, so I'm pretty sure uh, the series is four. Because uh, I'm thinking, man, like, he's on a roll right now, you know, Macedonia. And, you know, it's one of those things where I kind of wish, you know, I didn't know how many episodes were in this series because, like, if I didn't know, I, and I, and just, I just figured maybe it was 12 episodes. Okay, cool. I, like, Macedonia could easily win this next battle. And then we have a big battle on our hands, a big awesome war on our hands, and things would be great. But I know there's only one more episode left. And obviously, if Macedonia were to win the next battle, it wouldn't end the series. I mean, it would continue going on because Rome obviously is not falling right now. So it just, it just you know, pretty much I know that that was basically the last victory of for Macedonia and I guess because last episode pretty much is going to close it off you know that's kind of just how you read these situations you know with uh, how many episodes left which sucks because I'm supposed to be you know, paying attention to you know how the you know the war goes but then you know in the back of your head how many episodes are left so you know kind of how it's probably going to end but Anyways, I'm definitely very happy that Macedonia won that battle. Uh, I thought it went by too quick for me, but definitely pleasantly surprised. And good stuff, Macedonia. Uh, hopefully that victory for them brings allies to their side. I mean, they had, they had, uh, they had some defect, not many, but some defect, to, I guess, to his side that they said. But 
All right, like they said, he needs like a major victory pretty much for the rest of the people in his area to kind of come to his side because they're still afraid of Rome because they know that's just one battle. You know, Rome, you know, is still this Goliath waiting, you know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there's the allies, they're, they're not weird, they're not going to jump on the bandwagon quite yet, you know, with Macedonia. So, the rest of the Greeks are still like waiting to see. And uh, I think a lot of them are, are just starting to realize that, you know, Rome is not going to let them, you know, uh, be free, that they're basically going to be under Rome's power. And I think, I think right now, a lot of them are probably just regretting it, you know, not being on like Philip's side earlier, you know, because they kind of see how Rome is and how they, they want to be the number one power and they don't want anyone else to rise, but rise to their level. And so uh, I think they're just realizing that it's just too little, too late, you know. You know, Rome has gotten the power, more more power. So you know, it's going to be hard to knock them down. But anyways, guys, definitely a great episode. I hope you guys agree. Let me know in the comments below what you think of this episode. That'd be great. And I'll definitely catch you guys tomorrow for the finale of the Macedonian Wars. Definitely a great series. Uh, it's kind of cool to see kind of Hannibal kind of like flip around over there. I don't know what's going on with that, but uh, maybe I'll find out in a future series because obviously I go back and forth with everything and they all intertwine with each other, which is part of the awesomeness of doing this history, you know? So uh, it's going to be sad when I do every single one and have everything's are connected. That, that's, that'll be a sad day, but that's a long time away. So until then, though, let's enjoy yourselves with more history and awesomeness. Uh, like, subscribe, guys. I'll catch you guys in future videos. You guys have a great night, great evening. And I'll catch you guys. Like I said, uh, yeah, peace. <laughs> Out of here.